Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Red Game Tidicom video, we're going to be running through the first part of everything you need to know about PlayStation 4 Pro. I say first part because the lead PS4 architect, Mark Cerny, will be providing a lot more information on the semi-custom GPU changes inside the Pro, so once this information comes to light, we can fill you in in the blanks in Sony's new console. But in this part, we'll be tackling the console's price, release date, how games work across the vanilla and Pro system, the rendering techniques, the console's performance, and a whole bunch more stuff. So the PS4 Pro will see a release in November 10th, 2016 for the princely sum of $399.99 US dollars or $349.99 Great British Pounds. The Pro will include a slightly tweaked and updated DualShock 4 controller as found within the PlayStation 4 Slim, a faster Wi-Fi connection thanks to IEEE 802.11, adapter and in addition of a third USB 3.1 port. For storage, Sony have opted to once again choose to go for one terabyte of space which has led to some folks criticizing the console for lack of storage. The decision was likely made for cost cutting purposes and shouldn't be too difficult to install a larger hard drive as you've been able to do in previous PS4 models. Unlike the Xbox One though, Sony have made a very baffling choice when it comes to emitting the 4K Ultra HD Blu-ray drive. Despite their own company holding the patent, while Sony's Andrew House has said this is due to users primarily watching content via streaming, it's probably another cost-cutting measure, pushing the console under the all-important $400 US threshold. For those wanting to grab a cheap 4K Blu-ray player, it's a shame, and if Microsoft can manage to add it to the Scorpio, with cost being the only thing preventing it, since the Xbox One S does have it, it'll be a nice feature to Microsoft to tout over the Sony. But, aesthetically, the system looks very similar to the PS4 Slimline, but it's just had a growth spurt. The design cues are very similar across both systems, likely one of the reasons Sony was so upset about the Slim leaking. A curious change lies in the back of the console, showing the removal of the traditional figure 8 power cord, and instead we're left with a kettle lead connector. This is the same type of pl plug you'd see on a PC PSU, or even a launch model PS3. While the power consumption is listed at up to 310 watts, it's not clear if that's the max the PSU can handle of the PS4 Pro or if it's a typical usage scenario power consumption figure. The PS4 Pro will improve graphics for owners of both 1080p and 4K screens, so let's talk about how this works. It's imperative to know there won't be a specific version of the game you need to buy for the Pro, and all PS4 games will work across both systems, but with that said, there will be some titles which will receive a patch, and new games which will launch will support the Pro's improved visual capability. Hardware will be the same, with the Pro being fully compatible with current PS4 peripherals, for example. If a game supports a patch, for example The Last of Us Remastered or Black Ops 3, and you're running on the Pro, the patch will be able to be downloaded and you'll be given access to higher quality rendering options. We'll get more into that in just a moment. Other, later released games will support the Pro at their launch, meaning that if you plop in a copy of Rise of the Tomb Raider or Mass Effect Andromeda into your PS4 Pro, you'll enjoy the additional visual clarity of the Pro but you can still take that same physical copy to your friend's house for them to play on their launch PS4. There will also not be specific DLC for one version of the game or another, so while patches for improved graphics will be exclusive to the PS4 Pro, there won't be a patch to say add in exclusive levels or other gameplay altering content for Pro players. And if a game does not have a visual slash performance patch available for it, because the developers have opted not to release one, the title will still play fine on a PS4 Pro, no harm, no foul. Mark Cerny filed a patent back in February 2015 titled Backward Compatibility Through the Use of Smooth Clock and Fine Grain Frequency Control, which in a nutshell appears to be the Pro would check the game to see if the software in this case was designed to support the Pro hardware. If the answer is no, the hardware will essentially emulate the functionality of the original PS4, so you won't really notice the difference between the game running on a vanilla PS4 and the Pro, at least in theory. We'll discuss the hardware of the system in a moment, but titles on the PS4 Pro run a mixture of native 4K and upscaling with a variety of different frame rates. 
Naughty Dog have confirmed The Last of Us Remastered, for example, will offer 30fps and a 60fps option, just like the original PS4 release, and if you opt to play the game at a lower frame rate, the title will render internally at a full 4K resolution, or you can select 60fps and play at a more stable frame rate and enjoy better quality graphics over the original PS4 release, but obviously not enjoy the native 4K resolution. The same could also be said for Rise of the Tomb Raider where you get an in-game menu where you can select either better quality 1080p visuals or you can simply opt to have higher quality 4K um, native resolution. So it's pretty much up to you. You can have either better looking 1080p visuals with more stuff on screen or you can just have a higher resolution image. The PlayStation 4 Pro's GPU just isn't powerful enough to run all games at a native 4K frame buffer. We'll discuss the specs and how they stack up against Microsoft's Project Scorpio in just a moment. So, because of this, Sony are encouraging developers to use advanced upscaling techniques such as checkerboard rendering, and this reduces the workload on the GPU, while, in theory, still providing tangible visual upgrades over the original game. In leaked PS4 documents, Sony specifically suggested using checkerboard rendering and other similar techniques as a method to boost visual quality and this also reduces GPU workload. We've seen these techniques before mentioned in Ubisoft's rendering techniques for Rainbow Six Siege and even Valve discussing them uh, during advanced VR rendering discussions at GDC. Essentially, in checkerboard rendering techniques, pixels are extrapolated through various grids. For example, a 2x2 block is then converted to a 4x4. Since the PS4 Pro's GPU outputs around 4.2 teflops of performance, that's around 2.3 times that of a vanilla system. This is a match made in heaven. 4K requires four times the number of pixels of 1080p, which is a goal far too lofty for the Pro, but two times the pixels is well within its wheelhouse, and so it leaves a, lot, a little grunt left over to use however the developers choose. If you carefully examine certain videos, for example Mass Effect Andromeda, which uses these rendering techniques, it's clear there are some notable, noticeable artifacts and patterns along diagonal lines, for example, and a softer image than if the game was being rendered natively at 4K. There are certainly a lot of other techniques developers can fall back on, such as temporal reproje reprojection, which was used in Killzone Shadowfall. There's a link in the video description where we have an in-depth analysis of that. But overall, it's hard to argue that the visual upgrade isn't very impressive compared to what's possible on a regular PS4 system. And we suspect that over time, developers will better learn to use the hardware, and thus visual quality will be even higher. So what happens if you plug your PS4 Pro into a 1080p screen? The answer is it depends what the developers wish. The hardware knows what screen you've got your system plugged into, and Mark Cerny has already discussed how Epic Games have pushed higher quality textures, lighting and dynamic reflections, and other improvements in Paragon. Meanwhile, Shadow of Mordor by Warner Brothers has seen the inclusion of super sampling, anti-aliasing, and other titles we've pushed with higher quality visuals were a mixture of what we've just discussed. The simple way of describing it all is, while a launch model PS4 was capable of matching a PC's medium settings, the PS4 Pro will be a mixture of high to ultra, albeit with lower frame rates. We also need to touch on high dynamic range, HDR which improves the visual quality of scenes by providing a better representation of how you'd really see those scenes in re real life in terms of lighting. In essence, there's a greater amount of colours, contrast ratios, and this leads to more vivid and beautiful images. While this feature is also supported on the vanilla PS4 after the update, and of course the Xbox One S, I suspect it will be one of the harder features for Sony to sell the system on. For a start, not every 4K display, let alone 1080p, supports HDR, and to really experience the visual jump, you need to witness the content on a HDR screen. So in short, you need to see it to believe it. But as HDR TVs grow in market share, it will naturally become part of the ecosystem. Despite all the leaks and rumours, the PS4 Pro fits right into the levels of the performance hinted at in the documents sent out to developers a couple of months ago. We've, need, we've seen no panic upclocking of the GPU or CPU to improve the console's performance in the wake of Scorpio's announcement, and AMD's Polaris architecture is unsurprisingly powering the device. Though Mark Cerny did make a rather interesting comment. He said that they'd, inc 
It had also included technology from several generations above Polaris, but what that technology is or how important it is remains to be seen. The AMD Jaguar is increased from a rather meager 1.6 GHz from the PS4 vanilla to 2.1 GHz with the same number of cores, that would be 8, and the GPU features 2,304 shaders running at 911 MHz. Memory bandwidth has also seen an increase from 176 gigabytes per second all the way up to 218, but it's important to note that this is not an apples to apples comparison, because the Polaris architecture has numerous memory bandwidth saving techniques, so the real world benefit of this bandwidth increase would be a lot higher if the Pro was still using the same GPU as seen in the launch console. Christian Grilling, who is the lead developer over at Sony's Naughty Dog, has confirmed that occasionally their system will suffer from CPU bottlenecks. I quote, Developers are free in single player mode to make their games run at a higher frame rate if they can. For AAA games, we tend to use everything in the machine. When we're moving from the standard PS4 to PS4 Pro, we have double the GPU. On the CPU side, we don't have double the CPU. We just have a higher clock rate. But it would mean that we have. But what it would mean is we'd be bottlenecked by the CPU. In other words, in some instances, the game is not held back by the GPU, and it is actually the CPU feeding the data to the GPU. So in those cases, you can see instances of unstable frame rates. But we won't know more until the system's finally released. Now we need to discuss the PS4 Pro up against Microsoft's Project Scorpio which won't see a release until holiday 2017, at least according to Microsoft. There remains a lot of questions regarding the new Xbox, not least of which is the price. Microsoft have said it'll make sense to the gamers, in the price that would be, and in a year it'll be easier to put out a faster console but keep costs down and too high and it'll keep, turn off gamers, but that still doesn't really answer what the end price for users is going to be, given the $400 US of the PlayStation 4 Pro. Scorpio 6 a T-flop GPU will likely struggle to run all games at 4K, but still has a rather large raw horsepower advantage of about 43% over the Pro. There are questions when it comes to the CPU and memory. Microsoft have only revealed it's an 8-core processor, but if it's still a Jaguar at the same or perhaps higher clock speeds than the Pro, will run into the same frame rate issues still, like we just mentioned with the Pro. On the other hand, Microsoft could opt to use Puma, which is a slightly evolved version of Jaguar, or they could even use something different, for example Zen, but that's very unlikely. And really, it comes down to pricing again. Judging from images of the Scorpio's board, assuming they're accurate, it appears that we're going to be seeing the memory in the console at 12 gigabytes of GDDR5, and this is with 320 gigabytes per second of bandwidth. This does give Scorpio a hefty memory advantage. The Pro does afford an additional 512 megabytes to games developers, which is reducing the chunk of RAM allocated to the OS rather than additional RAM soldered onto the board. But even so, there's about four gigabytes of extra memory in the Scorpio. And in theory, this will lead to shorter load times on the Scorpio, higher quality textures and other assets if games developers do opt to use it. <coughs> So, currently, Sony have the horsepower advantage, but in 12 months, the tables will turn in a radical way, putting Microsoft in the same position Sony were at the release of both the next generation consoles. My take on the PS4 Pro is a mixture of subtle disappointment, but also feeling very optimistic. I know that's a bit of a strange mix, but overall, the visual quality is palpable in its update compared to the previous generation, and it's doubtless that first party games will benefit heavily. But if you're yet to buy into the PS4 ecosystem, the PS4 Pro is a perfect time to start. But if you're already a PS4 owner, but only play the system for exclusives and multi-platform games generally on PC, there's little to actually convince you to make the jump, because the PC versions will still look better. But if not, one could make a compelling case for waiting for the Scorpio. But if you're worried, and that is if you're worried about cash flow, but for the here and now, Sony have done a decent enough job to pique my interest. And unlike traditional console launches, games will take advantage of the new hardware immediately. So it's down to Sony to convince existing owners to part with their cash, given, for example, the PlayStation VR's launch, and for those yet to join the Sony's family, Will shinier graphics be enough, especially with PC gaming becoming more popular? 
So my take on it, the PlayStation 4 Pro is not a revolution, but I really like what I'm seeing so far. However, I'm going to reserve judgment over the next couple of months to see just how many developers take full advantage of the hardware, what the actual differences are when we're playing the damn thing, and naturally, what can Sony do aside from slightly nicer graphics? Is it going to make a large difference, for example, in virtual reality to tempt people away? With all of that said, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. There will be a couple of follow-up videos which is going to go further into high dynamic range as well as the custom changes to the PS4 Pro's GPU once Mark Cerny talks about them in the next couple of months. And of course we're going to delve more into the horsepower of the system, rendering techniques and a lot of other stuff. So if you're not subscribed, well, please go ahead and do so. With all of that said, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. Um, the normal stuff, subscribe if you, well, want more. Uh, like, share, comment, you know, that type of thing. You can find all of the social links in the video description, so feel free to shoot me a message. And, well, I'll see you hopefully soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.